as the program manager of the Future of Cooling program at the Oxford Martin School here in Oxford, one of those really forward-looking programs that identified one of yeah the big challenges that we have in energy, which which is cooling. Uh, and it's nice to see that they're, they're not just approaching it in the air conditioning sense, but Nicole also addresses passive cooling and other solutions, uh, which we'll learn about. And and one of the things that sparked this talk was a, a wonderful paper in Nature Sustainability, which I invite you all to to read, but we might learn about it here today, which links uh, cooling issues to all 17 sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, which is quite something and it's it's as i say it's a good read um have a look at it uh and another wonderful thing is that most people when when i discuss cooling uh there's a sort of moment of dread uh what a big problem it is uh, here's a nice positive spin on uh the challenge from uh nicole's abstract which says um, that there's an opportunity to moderate the trajectory which i think is a wonderfully positive spin and i look forward to hearing about it over to you nicole well, thanks, Phil. That was a fantastic introduction. Um, yes, so uh, in today's talk, we are going to talk about the future of cooling and how it's linked to all those sustainable development goals. Um, we, I'm, I'm basing it on this paper that, Philip, you've mentioned. It's uh, Cooling for Sustainable Development, and I've added there the author's link. So if you want to access it after the talk, I will share these these uh, slides and you can enter the paper. Um, so this presentation is structured around the paper as well. So um, it will give you an overview of what we talked up and discussed in the perspective. It'll start with uh, why cooling? What are the challenges around it and why is it why it's a dreadful theme sometimes. There's lots of chilling prospects around cooling. So that's going to be theme number one. Then um, the relationship that we've found between cooling and the sustainable development goals. Um, third, we propose an analytical framework to look at the solution space of cooling. And from this framework, there are intervention points. Uh, and I'm going to go into four exemplary ones that we think can make a big difference to make cooling sustainable. Uh, finally, uh, well, number five, we're going to go through the cooling uh, research and practice agenda. There's three principles that we would like you to take uh, with you today. And uh, finally, a small introduction to our team and program team that co-authored this uh, paper. So uh, why cooling? Cooling by many has been described as an agent of modernity. So pushing uh, the development of, of countries, especially in tropical hot places, but it does have chilling prospects. And if we see at it, we look at it today, there's 1.1 billion people facing risks. Um, they, these are health and life threatening risk from lack of access to cooling because they can't get thermal comfort. And the other side of it is that the projection of cooling in the next 30 years and beyond is, is surprisingly unprecedented. We're going to go from 1.6 billion now to 5.6 billion 2050 if we don't stop this. So that's equivalent to 10 air conditioners being sold every second for the next 30 years. It's it's such an enormous amount of energy that is required to power these air conditioners that it's equivalent to the energy that today is needed by the US, Europe and Japan together. So that's the scale of the problem. Okay, And if we go beyond the 2050 prediction, we get this graph here. You can see that by 2000. 100, it's going to be way beyond heating. Um, so we're we're just around here now. We're at the beginning of this S curve of demand for air conditioning. And we have an opportunity to, to start shaping this in a more sustainable way. Now, we don't want a world like this uh, beautiful art piece from my colleague Antonella, full of air conditioners, because air conditioners have problems. There is efficiency 
issues. Most people are buying not the most efficient air conditioners available. And um, air conditioners use refrigerant that they, the initial problem was that they were ozone depleting refrigerants, but today the conversation is much more around how potent these are as global warming, their global warming potential is so much more potent. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. And in light of all these forecasts, cooling is still a blind spot in today's energy and sustainability debates. So for example, we could only find one reference to cooling in the UK plan to zero carbon, and it's an annex to heating. Um, and then in the wider picture in the sustainable development goals, we couldn't find any word referred uh, in them to cool or cooling or cold or refrigeration or freeze. None of those words featured in the SDGs, although the impact in our energy system is going to be major. So the two gaps that this paper is looking into is first, is there and to what extent is there a relationship between cooling and sustainable development goals? And then um, second of all, is how do we approach cooling in a holistic way? Currently, the literature is more on in silos. So we have um, cooling technology, for example, looking into efficiency of one component of those air conditioners or vernacular cooling. Uh, looking at architecture and culture in buildings that need cooling. And uh, there's um, different definitions of thermal comfort, but how do we bring all these disciplines together to get the most out of research and put cooling in the right pathway towards sustainability? So we've done this, our, our methodology in, in a couple of points is we've done a systematic review of the literature to look at those links of cooling and SDGs, develop the, that analytical framework and propose uh, high potential interventions and an agenda. So let's start with the first, cooling and the SDGs. Uh, preliminarily, we had a brainstorm or an expert elicitation method on uh, all the targets of the SDGs. There's about 160, if I remember correctly. And we went through this list and um, brainstormed, can we find a link? Can we find an example that links um, cooling with that target? Just to get a sense of, is this worthwhile exploring? Okay, so this is not in the paper actually, but it's the preliminary work. And as you can see in this figure, all the red marks are um, our targets that we considered could have a linkage. So, and all of the SDGs have at least one red mark. So we considered that that there was a there was a a gap there that we could address. So then we said we have to do this in a systematic, reproducible way as research requests. So. We went to find the evidence through a systematic literature review and we carried out 17 searches, one for each SDG. Um, there was common words that related to cooling that you can see in this block and we combined them with the 17 SDG that um, words and terms um, that we could find from the description and the UN website, uh, but also we refined them in an iterative process. Um, so I've I've taken up here SDG 7, which I believe is of interest for this public. Um, and so those are the kind of words that we looked for. And uh, we found 5.3 million papers that refer to sustainable development goals. But from that universe of papers that or papers and reviews and patents that we found, on Web of Science, um, only 0.43% had mentioned a cooling related terms. So let's let's put that into each SDG. Here you can see 
that the blue bar uh, shows the literature for that specific SDG. And then the subset is an orange of of SDG literature that contain cooling terms. Now this is a logarithmic scale, so you can see that that 0.43 percent is is in there. We we just it, it just seems a bit more amplified because of the of the scale. Um, the the SDGs that were most related to cooling is um, expectedly SDG seven because of that huge demand that we'll need to power air conditioners if we follow that trajectory. Um, also SDG 12. SDG 12 is about responsible production and consumption. And uh, we found it more related with cooling, not only because of the responsible production and consumption of refrigerants involved in cooling, but also because cooling helps the responsible production and consumption of food, for example, through cold chains. So, so those are the, the two most related. They're only 1.5 order of magnitude difference between papers in those. Um, and the least related SDGs that we found is SDG 4, which is about quality education. But there is a linkage there regardless that we're going to touch on afterwards. And SDG 17, which is partnerships for the for the goals. So those are more than three orders of magnitude difference uh, between the total number of papers we found related to the SDG and the subset of of literature re related to cooling. So um, I I'll show I'll dig dive a little deeper, let me, there we go, into some SDGs and um, give you examples of how they're related to cooling. If you want to have a look at all of the SDG relationships, please look at uh, our, our paper or we can we can discuss more in the questions uh, part. But just to give some examples of the links that we found. So SDG 2 is on zero hunger, and that again touches on cold chains. So uh, cooling, we found that there's lots of literature around cooling greenhouse greenhouses and aquaponic systems. So obviously cooling there is supporting the delivery of food. Then SDG 3 on health and well-being um, is, is quite linked to cooling because it, cooling can reduce the health burden of severe exposure to heat. And not only the health burden of an individual or a community, but also on, on health systems. And that's what we're actually looking at in one of our work packages in the program. Um, number four, quality educa education. We found literature talking about how extreme temperatures can impair uh, cognitive faculties and also productivity and learning outcomes. So cooling has a, a real potential there to mitigate those effects, especially in, in tropical areas and developing countries. Um, SDG 6, for example, on clean water and sanitation, we found literature that talks about industrial cooling. So industries require huge amounts of water for their process for cooling. And um, when, when uptaking that water, they start to compete with resources that the community might need for, for water. So it's a, it's a very sensitive topic as well. SDG 7, we've covered already because we know that cooling is going to require an enormous amount of energy, but here's a twist. It can, it, it's a vice versa. Thing. There are some uh, some um, renewable energy systems that need cooling. For example, solar concentration. All those salts reach temperatures that sometimes you can't process. Um, so so it needs to be cooled after. So so there's positive and there's negative loops here. Um, I'll, just to take another two or three examples. SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production. 
lots of that literature talked about refrigerants, and these are called HFCs and CFCs, are mainly known as that. As that. And um, so how do we produce them in a responsible way so that we don't have leaks during the production or during the assemblage of, of cooling technology? And how do we decommission cooling technology so that those HFCs and CFCs don't reach the atmosphere? And then finally, one that was quite surprising is life below water, which is a bit similar to the clean water and sanitation. So industry using so much, needing so much input of water for their cooling processes, um, they they take the water and then they release it back. And sometimes it's not, well, it wouldn't be at the same temperature. Um, it'll be in a, in a threshold given by regulations and so, but the small difference in temperature does affect uh, the local diversity. And we found this really interesting paper on jellyfish being uh, yeah, the, the, a, a local community of jellyfish just really surging because it was next to an industry that used uh, water for cooling. So there is examples like these for all of the sustainable development goals. And um, the next step is to say, we've got all these links, how do we organize them? And how do we analyze them in a more systematic way and point them towards interventions that can make cooling uh, more sustainable? So uh, here comes our proposed analytical framework. And the question that this is uh, answering is, what does the solution space for transitioning cooling to sustainable development look like? OK. Um, Many of you might have heard of different frameworks that look into these transitions, but I'm just going to cover a couple to say why we need a new one for cooling. So you've got the um, system innovation and multi-level approach frameworks, which are very much on the technological side and are based on a technical technological innovation to make it to break into the market. So it's considering the tech side, which of course is important cooling, but it's not the whole picture. We have uh, the transition management framework, which is more on the governance side. So then you're missing out on the tech bit. And then there is a socio-tech one and an energy culture one that I think has been talked about previously in this colloquium. Um, and that one is a great tool to analyze socio-technical systems of cooling. Uh, however, we wanted a framework that took the micro and took the macro too. So it also included governance and institutions and markets. So our multidisciplinary approach consists first of all of macro drivers. Okay, so we identified four macro drivers and these are external to a cooling system, but it's they still influence it. Okay, so Socio-economical drivers is the first, and you can see that energy prices increase in income, urbanization, and population growth are key for here for, for this macro driver. And some evidence from Mexico especially has come to, to show us that S curve that I sure showed you earlier. When there's an increase in income and there's an increase in uh, temperatures, uh, it's natural for uh, the that a community or a society to buy more air conditioners uh, or technologies. But unfortunately, we've seen the air conditioner side. Technology also may drive demand for cooling. Um, more recent example is the COVID vaccine. Needs minus, the Pfizer one needs minus 80 degrees. The Moderna needs minus 20. So technology also may shape the demand for cooling. And a more traditional um, example is data centers, which have their own cooling needs. Uh, they're even thinking of moving some to cooler places in the world to save on energy. The environmental trends are obviously going to affect the demand for cooling. Uh, and so as climate change increases worldwide temperatures, 
we're going to need more cooling for thermal comfort. And it's a it's a risky cycle that we can get into because as temperatures increase, we will want more air conditioners. But if we get more air conditioners, we're going to spend more energy and potentially increase our greenhouse gas emissions and create more climate change. And then the circle starts again. So, so we have to be very aware of which technologies we're going to implement for that. And finally, the macro driver, the final macro driver is geopolitical, and this is a macro one. And it's all about the governance um, and how it can drive countries and private sectors to develop cooling technologies and policies. In there, we've got Montreal Protocol and Kigali Amendment, which I'll touch on a bit more in detail later. So as a second stage or, or a second part of our uh, cooling framework, we uh, establish stages of cooling and uh, it resembles the stages of a life cycle. First, uh, it's getting the resources you need for a technology, so extraction of materials um, and that kind of things, and then you assemble those materials in a production line to materialize a, a passive or an active uh, technology and it goes not only from the assemblage point of view but also to the deployment of that technology. Cooling activities which is including the purchase, the operation and the maintenance of a technology and finally the end of life which uh, we would hope feeds back into resource when including recycle and upcycling. So I wanted to run you through the stages of cooling for two um, examples of technologies. The first is an active technology and this um, it's more it's more of an active system. District cooling. So district cooling is all about having a centralized cooling technology. It could be air conditioners, it could be chilling, but it could also be radiative cooling, for example. So um, that's a that's a passive system of moving the heat gains to the space. It sounds a bit like science fiction, but I swear it's true. You can look at a startup in California that is, is looking into this and getting very far with it. So, um, so this centralized cooling equipment uh, sends usually water as a heat, um, as a, a heat distribution liquid to different buildings and flats, okay? And if you run through the stages of cooling here, you see the resources is going to be all the metals that need need to be uh, used for the production of these this technology, the pipelines that connect each building, and um, of course the the water that is going to circulate or another heat transfer fluid. Then the production and assemblage is quite interesting. It's everything that is done offsite and then installed in this setting okay uh, it sometimes if a city is quite dense you would need to install this these pipes in coordination with other developments in the area for example so it, it really requires lots of uh, people working together um, cooling activities is more end user oriented so it uh, it's what uh, the end user decides to put in their own air handling unit in their flat as, uh, as for example setting their their thermostat um, but it also has to do on the maintenance of this central plant and operation of the central plant that could be by another company and of course end of life is decommissioning maybe at the same time than the building perhaps before this this would be changed um, but uh, yeah, it really, really depends on the model of the building. And uh, another example on a completely opposite uh, side, a, a passive technology example, is using plants. So your resources are going to be very, very different. Seeds, cutting, trees from nurseries, etc. Production and assemblage. Now, you'd say, oh, you just plant trees around, but let me say that it's very important to have the right orientation because you want to maximize 
uh, wear this, uh, the shielding of uh, the sun, so those heat gains. And uh, trees are fantastic for cooling and vegetation in general. Not only they provide shading, but they have um, uh, internal process, evapotranspiration, it, it's called, and that uh, uses latent heat in a biological process. Um, so it captures latent heat from the, from, um, the atmosphere. So it's really an uh, interesting one. And that's why it's so popular right now, green facades, green roofs, green walls, okay? Cooling activities, what you would do in your garden for these trees, and end of life, hopefully these trees and vegetation could be used for biomass reheating for, as an example. So those are the stages of cooling that we've defined. And now we look at a kind of a, a matrix, a transpose. How do, what are the levers of change that can influence and shape these stages of cooling? And we came up with five, okay? So the first one is social interactions right here. And this is all about the behaviors that can shape technology adoption. So for example, with climate action, there's more, uh, more pro-environmental choices being driven, right? But, uh, but so that's a positive one, but there's also a negative one that in some cultures having an air conditioner is something of status. So just a picture from my colleague Antonella again, uh, she took this picture in the Amazon and you can see it's, it's a low income house, but it has an air conditioner right there. So that was a priority for that family or individual um, to have one. Unfortunately, uh, the, in this particular case, the behavior um, or the choice of the end user took them to choose uh, an air conditioner that is probably not the best in terms of efficiency. I dare to say it probably has uh, leaks of refrigerant. So, so you can see social interactions will actually have an uh, important uh, effect on uh, cooling activities, particularly. Um, on technological innovation, each one of the stages of cooling that we've defined can be better, for example, uh, can be improved, for example, in efficient, efficiency and materials. So innovations are, are quite important in this space. One that is quite well known is looking for face changing materials so that um, and that's a passive system. So if you have uh, walls that have face changing materials, they can um, absorb more heat and, and that makes uh, a time attenuation between the gaining heat outside uh, and uh, coming inside uh, and into an inside space. Um, third, we have as a lever of change business models. So how firms put forward a uh, value proposition around cooling technologies and measures. And uh, here firms can be on one of the stages of cooling or they can be on several ones. It really depends on that value proposition that they're offering. A more macro one, uh, a, a more macro lever of change is governance. So um, this is to do with aligning all the actors in the cooling space. Um, and steering the direction of the transition via policy. And here we've got several instruments, um, regulatory instruments or performance standards, national, international agreements um, that can play a really important role. And finally, infrastructure design we've identified as a lever. Um, this can shape it in a, in a, positive way by ena enabling more cooling, but it also can constrain cooling because um, it it has to do with the built environment that might uh, might uh, show us if we can apply certain cooling or not. So access to electricity, for example, to electricity networks will absolutely say if an active system is applicable or not. And that's to do with 
what's available already in the built environment. But um, there's also soft infrastructure. So for example, skills that are in an area to maintain certain technology or to bring it in to the, to the area. So uh, absolutely infrastructure and its design can be a driver, but also um, can constrain the space of cooling. So when we cross over these levers and the stages of cooling, we get 20 intervention points, we call. And in the next part of the presentation, I'll be talking about uh, four interventions that we believe could make a difference in turning cooling more sustainable. Okay. Um, so the first one is going to cover uh, cooling as a service. And we believe this sits in between cooling activities, well, mainly cooling activities, but it also touches on production and assemblage. And let me explain why. So cooling as a service is a business model. It's uh, kind of a pay as you go for cooling. Um, the value proposition of cooling as a service is to make sustainable and more environmentally friendly cooling broadly available. Okay, so this is effectively a company retains the ownership of the cooling assets. So in this example here, you can see the, the cooling equipment on the top of a roof and a company would own all of these and then provide the end user um, a pay as you go cooling service. It has a benefit for the end user because they don't have the upfront costs of investing in such a high tech system, but it also has the benefit that the, it's in the company's interest to have really efficient technology so that their operational costs aren't so high. So they will they will maintain these uh, as and theory suggests that in a better way than individual users. It uh, resembles um, the district cooling that I showed you previously, but the biggest difference is that this is a business model exclusively. So it's uh, technology agnostic um, and it could be for one building or it could be for several buildings. The focus of cooling as a service is a business model. The district cooling is has to do more with the layout. Okay, the second intervention um, is embedding passive and energy efficient cooling in systems. This is related to the avoid shift and improve um, measures uh, framework. So passive cooling is considered one of those avoid measure, avoid ways. Uh, by avoid it, I say I mean avoiding the use of energy for cooling. And um, we do need to focus on implementing these kind of of measures now in cities, now because they are going to be uh, a long-term investment. They they are um, more, they've got a, a longer lifespan than active cooling in general, because active cooling has electromechanical parts, spinning bits, heating bits, and those fail. So, so usually people will swap those components or generally the, the whole, the whole um, equipment out. And uh, why cities? Because cities is where cooling demand is and will be surging um, as prediction of population and, mi and migration are, are expected. Um, the biggest challenge seen for implementing passive cooling in, in a larger scale as in cities is the coordination between different people. So uh, New York had a green plan a couple of years ago, and um, they saw that challenge that they have to coordinate the architectures with the, with the engineers, organizations that use a lot of cooling and individuals to have one plan for the city because it's really going to change the landscape. It's going to make it greener, it's going to, or, or it's going to make it shadier. Um, and that these decisions have to take into account different uh, perspectives, obviously. And this is a beautiful picture from uh, Singapore 
uh, with their green plan in, in action. Um, so that's definitely helping as a cooling island. Uh, third intervention to talk through, just going to check how we're in time, um, is uh, the linking climate action and global face down of flue gases. So this is a governance in intervention. Um, so the the projection of flue gases, which are the refrigerants, the HFCs and CFCs, is uh, going to be quite impressive in a bad way. If we don't change the trajectory by 2050, it's expected that these gases are going to be responsible for 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. That's a huge amount. Um, and uh, just for a bit of history, the Montreal Protocol looked at the refrigerant gases in the 80s because of the ozone depletion potential. But more recently in, 20, in 2010s, the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol um, looked again into the refrigerants because the ozone depletion was being, uh, the goals around ozone depletion are being achieved, but um, the part of global warming potential of these gases was really surging. There, uh, some of these refrigerants are 10,000 times worse than CO2, so that's huge global warming potential. So um, the governance uh, intervention here is to make people more aware of this, uh, drive policy towards climate action on these gases, and and it's uh, the target of the Kangali Amendment is to phase them out um, at 80% in the next years. Um, so so it's a big it's a big one to ask for, but it's a one that's absolutely essential if we want to avoid that 20%. Um, and finally, the last intervention point is that we are suggesting is to understand more the role of lifestyles and behaviors in, in this cooling atmosphere. So lifestyle is a big one because changes are, are quite important. Um, for example, lifestyle in the US um, is, is very different than Europe and India. Uh, they consume six times more the cooling energy per capita than Europe and 28 times the cooling energy in India. So it's orders of magnitude, one order of magnitude, and uh, we really need to, to understand why is it that end users in the US behave like that compared to others and how do we shape so that the others don't follow those tra trends. And then there's altering habits. So, um, the, so this is things that behaviors that repeat themselves, right? How do we understand what will make a person change their thermostat? This is a, a problem that we've been looking at heating for years, but we're just looking at it from the other perspective, dialing that thermostat in the, in the opposite direction being a bit more tolerant to to high temperatures. Uh, but how do we how do we make this habit happen? Um, and so there's there's lots of social, cultural and psychological factors that uh, research and practice needs to understand. Um, another interesting uh, example on this front is when comparing Singapore to Japan. So Singapore uses air conditioning uh, as an everyday practice. A colleague of mine, he might be in the audience, uh, showed us a picture where uh, his family and friends were in, a, in a, a hotel with jackets on because it was too cold inside. And, and you know that it's a really hot country outside, right? So you can see that they're just very used to that. And that's part of the culture. And when you compare it to Japan, Japan is one of the countries that has the most air conditioners installed in homes. 90% of their homes have air conditioners, very similar to the US. However, they prefer natural ventilation. Air conditioning in Japan is a last resource kind of thing. They, they prefer to use lighter clothes, 
uh, natural ventilation. And only after that, if it's not enough, they switch on their air conditioner. So um, behavioral science and environmental psychology can play a really important role in shaping cooling. So we really need to understand it. That's that's what we we want to leave you with. So um, in these four intervention points and on our framework, there are underlying themes and we we call them principles and they're very outcome oriented. And there's themes that uh, three themes that we'd like you to take home as a as a message from our program. So in order to get cooling to the sustainable pathway that we wanted to get, first of all, we need to play place planetary stewardship and protecting people's need at the heart of cooling decision. The motivation behind this is that cycle that I, I spoke about before, it, and it's breaking that cycle. If we could get easily into this loop of high temperatures leading to increased cooling, leading to energy consumption, to rising greenhouse gas emissions, and leading to high temperatures again, and on and on. We have to break this, this cycle while phasing out ozone depleting um, refrigerants. And so it's a huge challenge, but that's the only way we're going to balance out the the use of cooling, the high demand for cooling, and uh, and um, the resource available available in the planet. So that's uh, an important balance. The second is uh, prepare and mitigate climate change impacts, which will demand cooling in varied geographies. So, as the motivation behind this is that as the planet clearly is warming up due to climate change, um, cooling isn't going to be only needed in tropical areas. It's, on, it's also going to be needed in places where traditionally the infrastructure is prepared for heating and not for cooling. For example, the UK, we're getting more and more heat, extreme heat weather events in, in the summer. Uh, last year was a, re a, a new record. And so we need to plan out for learn lo long term plans and processes and infrastructures and capabilities. And we have to start making those decisions now, because if we're going to incorporate passive cooling that uses less energy and it's more environmentally friendly, um, those need to be embedded into buildings and need to be planned into the architecture and into into building plans. So we need to prepare now. And this is um when we're all aware that it's going to get hot here and in tropical areas uh it'll give us an, that extra push of starting to plan so and the implications of this is increasing resilience of our buildings and of ourselves um so the the third point uh theme of sustainable cooling is to promote long-term um, sustainable cooling solutions over existing unsustainable business as usual alternatives. So I I know I've talked a lot about bad things of active cooling um, because of their refrigerants and the, their energy consumption, but uh, it it has been a solution so far for lots of places in the world. And that has to be acknowledged. There has been societies that has advanced in in by using air conditioners and achieving thermal comfort for their populations through it. Um, but the main message here is that active cooling is not the only alternative. And we are at risk at getting locked into this single technology instead of looking at, uh, at the alternatives. So that's what this uh, principle is about, looking at those other options. There's active technologies as well that are that use electricity, but they're they're uh, much more. Um, they lose they use less, uh, and they don't use the refrigerants. Um, and then from passive side, here in this example, you can see shading uh, as an important one. But we talked previously about the greenery, so vegetation, and orientation of buildings in the right places, face changing materials radiative cooling. There's a world out there 
of passive cooling technologies and that we really need to start embedding in in our buildings, but also in uh, when when educating professionals to say, OK, let's start with these ones as an avoiding uh, measure, uh, avoiding energy consumption measure. And then let's see if that isn't enough, then we include active cooling. Um, so yeah, so those are the three principles for sustainable cooling that we believe should shape the future agenda of research and practice in the cooling space. And um, just to finish, I'd like to introduce you to our team and program at the Oxford Martin School. This is the team and co-authors of the of the Nature Sustainability paper. Our PIs are Radhika and Malcolm here. And uh, you can see that uh, we're from primary care, engineering and geography. But within those uh, groups, we have economists, engineering uh, of different disciplines. So I'm chemical. Rinaldi here is mechanical. We've got uh, Antonin on the social science side of things, Philip uh, looking at cold chains and business models, etc. And then finally, please visit our website. Our, our program isn't only about understanding, so about researching, but it's also about shaping the future of coding. So if you can help us with that, we welcome your, your support. So thank you. I hope I didn't put you to sleep like this lady under a cooling book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still awake. Thank you very much. That was that was wonderful. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and and this is our chance to you know um, have a chat with Nicole and ask questions. So if you have questions, just pop them in the chat uh, or or wave your hand, um, and and we can uh, put you on and you, you can ask Nicole questions directly. Um, that was absolutely wonderful. I was, I was half expecting that if you want to link to all 17 uh, SDGs, some of them would be forced connections, but actually it, it's quite compelling. All of them really do apply to cooling. So that was interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the one that slightly reminded me of my own school days, uh, SDG 4 on, on teaching. I grew up in northern Germany, which by all accounts is not a hot place at all. But every now and then, if temperatures reached, I think it was 24 degrees Celsius by 10 in the morning, uh, they would ring the school bell and we were all allowed to go home because it was apparently too hot to run. Oh, was wow. Very popular, uh, <laughs> that required no air conditioning at all. Wow. Um, and, and that's so interesting because that shows a different resilience towards or, uh, you know, because in a tropical country, 24 degrees, you'd keep going with a, with a school day, you know? Right. Yeah, but it's because we're just we have different exposures and used to different things. Which is interesting because one of the things I learned through, through heating research is that we've got this obsession that throughout Hello? we contain, uh, maintain a perfectly flat temperature of say We're exactly degrees. And in practice, it turns out that people develop more comfort if they are exposed to more variation in temperature and this sort of dead pan flat temperature is, is not what is good for us at all. Absolutely. So if anybody has questions, the chat is there for you, or you can turn your microphone on and, and pose questions. Uh, we've got a whole new program here on, on cooling. Uh, and it's, it's nice to see that, you know, the Oxford Martin School can take on completely interdisciplinary and new challenges like this. Here is one. Thanks, Nicole, for a nice talk. Um, in fact, uh, Sajid, do you want to turn your microphone on and, and post your question directly? It's one of those rare opportunities we have these days to talk to each other. Uh, hi, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, and it was a really interesting talk. And uh, yeah, so as you said, uh, there are a lot of issues with active cooling technologies and we need to adopt uh, buildings and should design a buildings considering more passive technologies. So. My question is, is there any research or are you considering anything with renewable technologies or like solar? We can use solar technology with the vapor absorption cooling systems that have less emission problems. Mm -hmm. And what are, what is your comments on this? Yeah, absolutely. So, so renewables are 
definitely part of, of the solution. Um, in that, um, in the in the known frameworks of first you start avoiding the use of energy, then you make the use of energy highly efficient. So air conditioners or or active technology such as this vapor absorption technology. And um, thirdly, uh, you can add renewables to to um, whatever you need to um, and then mitigate carbon emissions. So um, absolutely using solar. Solar uh, cooling is a big topic out there. It is, in, uh, I've just seen a, a search of it in the last years. So um, that part is absolutely crucial for the for the future. Um, but as I said, it should be done in that in those steps because we don't want um, uh, renewable energy uh, that might be needed elsewhere taken by cooling in the first place if it could have been solved by passive. Um, so that's on, on solar and on vapor absorption. Um, there's plenty of research, both passive and active, actually. So vapor absorption for for everyone is um, using using latent heat. So, uh, but different than refrigerants um, in in an act in a traditional air conditioner system. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes, in fact, that that was on my mind too. So the the one comfort that I somehow take is that heat tends to cor correlate in some way positively with PV generation capacity. So you, you have something that's slightly happier in correlation than say uh, for the UK, you know, our, our peak demand is, is usually cold lead and solar will help you very little there. Um, mm -hmm. But I thank you there from subject. Thank you very much. And anybody else with questions, uh, here, here is your chance. Uh, open microphone if you like, um, so we can discuss more of these SDGs. I mean, there's so much you've touched on. And the the Japan example was interesting as well. The the other story that I've well um, actually there was a lot of research into uh, Japan's response to the Fukushima disaster when they were actually acutely short of energy, and mm -hmm. tried to find ways to reduce air conditioning loads, and developed this cool biz program where the government suddenly made a um, a campaign to encourage people not to have to wear a tie and a, a suit at work, which was you know a social norm and an expectation that. If you don't wear a suit and tie, you're disrespectful to your boss. And yeah. instead had a little sticker saying cool biz, which was there, get out of jail for not wearing a suit and tie. And you can then run the air conditioning not quite as hard and you can still have livable conditions. Yeah, absolutely. So that example um, that I gave before of like um, people in Japan do prefer to wear, wear light clothes and, and ven use ventilation before turning on the air condition. That's more in residential area. But yes, for for uh, working, it their their social norms are quite strict. And and so to take uh, to change from the from the suit is it's quite a challenge. That's why yeah. they needed their pin. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And do you have concerns that we might get a lot of air conditioning through the back door? So in the UK, for example, we're now having a real push towards um, heat pumps. And in a sense, that is air conditioning technology. So might there be, once we've got the technology installed, a sort of drive towards actually being rather tempted to use it as well? Yeah, heat pumps is a really interesting because it's basically a, an air conditioner that can be used in, in, two, in two directions, right? Um, but there is winds on the energy use uh, compared to a, a typical air conditioner um, and uh, the use of natural heat sinks, uh, ground or, or water is something that is more passive than. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? All Sorry, right? I just have, I might have had a cut out uh, with my audio. I think it's my my network that's telling me that it's poor. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, here's but, an excellent okay. one eating and cooling. Mm -hmm. Nick, do you want to turn your microphone on? Nick, you're still Can muted. you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Uh, thank you for a lovely talk. It's very interesting. Uh, I was just wondering, is active cooling using climate-friendly refrigerants and renewably generated electricity OK? Yes, yeah, so there is a lot of research to move those refrigerants to being more environmentally friendly and 
and to reduce those global warming potentials that it has. Uh, and there is candidates out there. It's the deployment, uh, a fast deployment of these that is, is a big challenge and swapping all that is already deployed with with the dirty refrigerants. Um, so so it's a new system needs to be in place. We're looking in the program at circular economy of cooling so that they're manufactured in a safe way, the um, less global warming potential. And then when they reach the end of life, they're also put back into the system and they're not leaked into. So there's definitely climate friendly refrigerants out there. We just need a, a really good system to support them um, and to get them out. And then uh, is there renewable generated electricity uh, to use for active cooling, you ask? Yes, as, as we said before, there is a lot, a, lot, a big surge on, on solar, for example, but um, then any renewable energy can power uh, electrical machine. Uh, that cools, so a refrigerator, or uh, or uh, an air conditioner, or an active technology, and that's definitely something that uh, needs to be part of the solution. But hopefully, the last step after passive cooling has been considered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Um, the, the other thing that sometimes slightly concerns me, I mean, you mentioned how temperatures are rising and and I, I'm sort of mindful of, you know, every now and then if you get highly volatile temperatures, it must, might just take one heat wave and people march off to their next uh, uh, store and, and buy themselves an air conditioning just because of one event. But once mm -hmm. they've done it, they've got the thing and, and they will use it. Is, is there any modeling that you do how sort of the volatility might actually uh, speed up the desire to have air conditioning? We're working at, at the moment at uh, predicting that kind of behavior, uh, but for that we need to look into the climate models and see see if uh, where those those uh, extreme differences will be. Um, if it's more stable and it's not like a one-time event, then you can harvest that because you can um, for example, use thermal mass in the walls. Uh, they heat up during the day slowly, and because of a big drop in temperature at night, you can ventilate them and cool them at, at night. And so a kind of free cooling, it's called. Um, but for these really fast changes, um, I think we need we we are looking into climate models actually to see what what parts of the world are going to be subject to that. Mm. Um, and and uh, so if we look at cooling degree days and how that variability is by by a very small uh, in a very small times, um, we could definitely look at the demand associated, especially if you weigh it by population and see how many people are exposed to to that kind of uh, rapid changes in temperatures. You can really look at uh, mm. uh, predicting, yeah. Fantastic. Well, it looks like your work is going to do an awful lot of good in all sorts of ways. So thank you very much. That was that was excellent. And thank you all for attending. And you're welcome again next week when we uh, welcome Jan Webb. And she's going to talk about a somewhat topical uh, issue about devolution and divergence. Uh, she's looking at how energy efficiency policy has developed in different ways between Scotland and England. I mean, she doesn't put it as provocatively, but it is a bit of a Scotland v England. Um, so we'll see who wins next week in this contest of energy policy. Uh, so you're, you're welcome again to join us. And for now, let's thank Nicole for a really fascinating talk on a topic of great importance. And I look forward to how this programme develops further. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can I just ask one quick question, please, or is it too late? Ah, uh, way too late. No, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to find out: Are there like opportunities for sustainable buildings in tropical countries, for example, where it's predominantly cooling? Is there um any way like to change the architecture to make the buildings more efficient to use less energy for cooling? Yes, absolutely. That's where that's where we should focus on because. That 1.1 billion people at risk at the moment are in those areas, and so um, 
there's a lot of knowledge in there already. For example, vernacular cooling, it, it considers culture of, of regions and putting that into their architecture and, um, and cooling through uh, well-known um, uh, measures in the region. Um, and they're mainly passive cooling. But um, yeah, going forward, when those countries jump to becoming more developed, um, we need to be careful that they they don't jump on the air conditioning uh, train and they and and that we can use passive measures more. Yeah, we seem to have lost some of those skills in the glass towers that we all aspire to in in urban areas. That resemble greenhouses, if you think about them. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, I see Anne has already posted a link in the chat. Um, have a look. That is for next week's talk. Uh, make sure you register. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Nicole, thank you so much. It's been excellent.